So we thank the SBDC. These are our uh, institutions that help us host this program and come to you and offer this type of service. Matt could not be with us today, but Matt has been a key help and support to help us get this program to you. For these sessions, uh, I am uh, Dr. Ed Ramirez, Doctor of Business Administration. Uh, so I'm gonna be working closely with you throughout the next three weeks. We did session one, so now this is gonna be session two. So hopefully everybody did their homework because we talked about personal finances. We have some people in the room, we have some people online. So we wanna make sure that we go through these that we covered last week, your assets, your liabilities, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about your homework and hopefully you guys got your credit report and you covered your idea. This is where we left it up. Today we were gonna be in part two. So the first thing I want to do is talk about your homework. And for those online, you can put it in the chat if you're able. For those in here, did you do your budgets? And how did those budgets come out? Came out pretty good. Oh, it came out <laughs> surprising. <laughs> so when you start looking at your, your revenue minus your expenses, it's kind of a challenge when you really start looking at all the money we spend. And sometimes we don't realize we're spending it. Like sometimes the, the, one, the monthly costs that are small are the ones that ends up throwing your budget off. The small cost is like people don't realize, well, I get a cup of coffee every day. I get a donut. I spend $5 every day, uh, but that adds up. You take that $5 times seven days, you know, you spend $35. You take that times 52 weeks, you know, times a year. So one of the things that I tell every business professional is your budget is central to your success. I live by a budget in everything that I do. I run my business. I run my accounting business. I run the ministry. I run everything that I run has a budget. If it's not in the budget, it doesn't happen. So basically, we don't do it. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. That's why uh, I tell business owners, the first thing you got to work is with pressure because we are in constant pressure. So you got to make sure that you put controls because you'll have your employees. You have your people say, why don't we buy this? Why don't we buy that? And what I tell everybody is this, if it's not in the budget, it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter who has, it doesn't matter who's requesting. If we don't have it, we don't do it because your budget is essential to your success. Uh, hopefully some of you got a chance to look at your credit score also and to see where your credit score hangs. Uh, most uh, after COVID, most businesses will do business with you. If you are at least a 650, many businesses will come and do credit with you. Below 600, uh, you start having difficulty. People start looking at you, the interest rates get higher. So I tell people to make sure that they looked at their uh, uh, credit score. On the budget, uh, sometimes uh, surprises come. Uh, so I always tell people when, the, you, when you do your budget, also put an emergency fund in that budget. Every week, I'm going to throw aside $20, $25, whatever it may be. Always have a contingency line, miscellaneous income line, where you throw money every single week. Because what happens? You drive a car, a tire blows out, that's $300 right off the get-go. You get up in the morning, your battery doesn't work, that's $250 off the get-go. So you have to make sure that you always have money set aside in your budget where every week you start budgeting your finances and you start to detail those finances in order to make sure that you are putting money away. Uh, so as you guys come online, I'm going to look at your chats later. I'm going to respond later. If you didn't get your uh, materials for today, I want you to make sure that you contact me, let me know, and I will get those to you tomorrow. So after we do the budget, after we do the credit score, after we do the idea, and we've analyzed our, our idea, we got to go to the step number three, which is your market. And the first thing you do in a market analysis is identify your market. It is very, very important. It's imperative that you see what market am I going to serve? And how do I target that market? And how can I be successful going after that market? And I think that one of the greatest mistakes business owners do, I said it last week, I'll repeat it again, 
what do we do? We run and we say we're going to service everybody. And that's not true. You have to target a market that is going to buy your product and that your product is going to satisfy your needs, especially your financial needs. And your product is going to give you your end result, what you desire. If that's not the case, then you might have a hobby, but not a business. So that's very important that you distinguish between a hobby, which is something you do on the side. If you make some money, that's good. If you don't make money, that's good also because it's a hobby. But if you're going to depend on this and you're going to live by this and you're going to be supported by this, you got to make sure that you do a budget. You got to make sure that you target your market. Today, we're also going to study assessment of management capabilities. Who do you need on your team? Many times when I get called into a business to do consulting, I ask them key questions. Who's going to do your bookkeeping? Well, the owner is going to do bookkeeping. Well, do you know how to do bookkeeping? Well, I really don't know how to do bookkeeping, but I can't afford a bookkeeper, so I'm going to do it myself. At least know how to add and subtract at a, as a bare minimum, and at least have everything on a spreadsheet. So you know all the revenue that comes in, all the expenses that come out, and see if there's a net or if there's a loss. If you can't do your bookkeeping, then you're going to need a lawyer to register your organization, to make sure your organization is legal. You need an accountant, even at the end of the year, to do the business accounting, to make sure that you prep your taxes and do what you have to do. You have to make sure that you have a manager. If this is going to be a, a location, a brick and mortar type location, then you need a manager and you need somebody to run the facility when you're not there. And then you usually need to have a backup because if you get sick or you get ill, Who's going to continue running your business? Who can step in and make sure that it's still running smooth or when you're going on vacation? So we're going to talk about your management needs and your management capabilities. And today there are many resources that are made available to us where we can hire marketing. We can hire people online and pay them for that online work. And I can give you some suggestions there. And then how to prepare your startup cost. And that is very important that you've already done your personal budget, the next step should be how do I prepare a budget for the startup of my business? You know, so if I'm going to rent a facility, I need to probably have the month rent security. So that's X amount of dollars. I need liability insurance. That's X amount of dollars. If I'm going to have any level of employees if other than your family or you, you need workmen's compensation. That's one insurance you cannot do without. In the state of New Jersey, as a matter of fact, workmen's compensation is the only insurance that can pierce the corporate veil. So if you don't have it and somebody gets hurt, even if they were working for you and you would, and you say, well, he was a 1099, he was a self-employed. The fact that he's working for your business and you don't have a 1099, you are responsible for any medical expenses that they incur. So it's very important that anybody that's listening to me, when it comes to your business, please make sure that you have liability insurance, work compensation, and that's part of your startup cost. Also, you gotta have in your startup cost, if you're gonna need marketing, advertising, where you're gonna market, where you're going to advertise, because a business success can fall or it can succeed based on its marketing. Marketing becomes super essential. Marketing becomes uh, uh, central. Uh, there's a company, for those of you that are have asked me, uh, well, who can I call if I need uh, assistance or uh, marketing? And there's a, a company called F-I-V-E-R-R, -E -R -R, Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. You can get the app, uh, and what they do is uh, you can shop for people that will do your marketing, will do your branding, will do your brochures, will do your logos. I use them. Very inexpensive. Uh, these are young professionals that that's all they do, and you can subcontract them and have them do your logo, your branding, your design, anything that deals with marketing, they can do it for you. So I use uh, Fiverr, again, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. You can download the app. I've used them on a number of projects, 
And those projects have been super, super successful because the branding has come from these experts and they charge me peanuts for it. Where you might pay somebody 50 to $100 an hour, you could go to Fiverr and get everything done for two, three, $400. Mm -hmm. And they'll do A to Z for you. So that's another area that we're going to discuss. Okay, so your market research. There are two types of researches that you have to do when you're going to start your own business. You will have to do a primary and a secondary market research. If you guys that are online look at this form, those that are in the class, I gave you this to you. It explains the difference between a primary market and a secondary market. Many people go into business and they've not done their market analysis. So it's very important that you understand that there's two types of market research. There's a primary and there's a secondary. If you look at this brochure, this brochure breaks it down for you in detail, but I'm gonna give you an overview of what it is. A primary research is when you actually go to the clients and see what the clients need. You do some type of survey, you do some type of, of uh, interview, you do some type of study one-on-one. -on -one. So basically you're doing your own survey, you're doing your own analysis, you're doing your own study. Uh, you could do it through survey, you could do it through observation, you can do it through experiments, and you can do it through interviews. And why would you do a primary market search? You want to know if there's a desire for your product. So what you do is you go out to the market and say, look, I'm going to sell widgets. How may widgets sell? I'm going to sell, like I know you guys sell pastries and cakes. I'm going to start selling cakes and brownies. I'm going to start cleaning offices. So I'm just doing a market analysis. I'm knocking on doors. I'm doing face-to-face -face interviews. Would you be interested? Is there something that you think can benefit you? Uh, do you think I can uh, supply pastries into your bodega every morning? I can bring a dozen of this, a dozen of that, and I'll be your supplier. Uh, so two times a week, I can come and give you my supplies, uh, bring some cakes and donuts, and we can split the profit 30 70. So a lot of small businesses start knocking on doors mm -hmm. and the primary market research is, is it going to help me? Is there a demand? If you go to 50 different stores, in your case, you sell pastries and stuff, you go to 50 different stores and nobody bites. Well, maybe you got to change your strategy. Right. Maybe that's not your market. Bodegas is not your market. Little stores, it's not your market. In the case of a cleaning business, I go to different office buildings and I say, look, like this building here, look, I can clean a lot of the offices here. Uh, and you knock on doors. This is my service. This is what I do. You're doing face-to-face -face interviews. Are you satisfied with the cleaning? Are you satisfied with the service? So now you're promoting, but you're also interviewing. And then I say, you know what? If you start your business, I might be interested. Uh, if you see that there's an interest in your product, then you move forward. If after doing primary market research and you're knocking doors, you're doing surveys, you're doing observation, you're doing interviews, and people are not interested, then that's not a good product. So what you have to do is you got to go to your market as if you already have the product in hand and you got to ask the people if they would be interested in hiring you. What happens with a lot of people is you get an idea, you run your business. But if you've not done a primary market search, what can happen is you might find out that somebody else is selling it, but they're selling it way cheaper than you, you are. For example, years ago, I started running my own computer business. That's how I started in the world of business many, many, many years ago. And I started building clone computers. But the first thing I did was I did an analysis with the schools. And I went into the schools and I said, I can build your computer. I can do it cheaper. I can do it better. These are the products I can put in. And I landed a few contracts overseas. So of course that benefited me because I already knew that I had a thousand computers sold already. So I knew that buying material and supplies was not gonna be a waste of money because there was a demand for my product back then. So what you wanna do is you wanna create demand. You wanna create interest. You wanna create that people really, really wanna get your product. And then you wanna do interviews. And on the primary research, you do interviews and then go to your family and go to your friends. Because 
Sometimes we don't like it, but they, they're going to be brutally honest. You know, if you want to launch as a cook and your own family doesn't want to eat your food, that might be an indicator that that's not a good thing to go into. So it's good to uh, get brutal opinions because if you don't, you might end up losing money. So I tell people, do your primary market research. So when you do the, it, over here, I already shared some of this. Surveys are very effective. If you want to see if your product is going to sell, a great online site that you can set up surveys is uh, SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey.com. Professionals use them. Uh, executive use them. I use them for my doctoral studies. Uh, it's a good site. So basically what you do in that site is you set up surveys and then you send an email to everybody that you know, everybody that you're connected to, and they take the survey online, totally, totally anonymous. So what happens is when they take the survey, you're going to get anonymous results. And that's good because that's going to tell you your range. Where are we ranging? You know what? I put a question out there. Uh, do you think uh, a mechanic shop will do good on Main Street and Denville? And the survey, I sent it to everybody in the Denville area, and I got an 80%, 70% response that they would like to see a mechanic shop in Denville. That's a good indicator. So on that question, hey, there's a demand for it. Uh, so what you do is you develop your questions with SurveyMonkey. You can do yes, no. You can do a, li a Likert, what they call Likert scale, uh, agree, disagree uh, type questions. So what you want to do is you want to develop questions that are geared towards your business that you know people are going to be interested to get that survey feedback to know that there is a demand for what you're offering. So surveys, super important. Most of you, if you realize when you go to the store right after you talk to customer service, what do they send you? Will you take a survey? The reason they're doing that is because through survey, they're going to better their service. They're going to, they're looking at that. And there's, they, they pose questions. Was the service on time? If they don't get a 10, they're going to jump on that shop and say, why was service not on time? And what can we do to improve? And how can we do it a better serve? Because we want tens and we're getting eights and sevens. Mm -hmm. So it's not a tool to get offended. It's a tool to really help you expand your business. Survey Monkey is excellent. Personal interviews. I tell people if you're going to start a business, depending on what field you're going to do or where you want to work, do interviews. You know, walk shop to shop, walk door to door. A lot of people don't like to do that. Uh, send messages. You know, can I sit down and talk to the owner? Can I talk to the CEO and pick his brain? One of the things that I do here on a daily basis is I work with CEOs. And I tell you, I've grown because I sit down and ask questions. And I see what CEOs are successful. I see which CEOs are struggling. I see which ones are just uh, stressed out. And then I ask, why are you stressed? What is the cause of your stress? What is happening? And I realized that a lot of CEOs get stressed because they're doing more than they should. Mm. You know, you're not the bookkeeper, but you're doing bookkeeping work. So while you can hire a bookkeeper, sometimes we think, well, you know what? Why would I pay somebody $20 an hour? I'll do it myself. Because you could have given somebody $40 and you could have gone out there and made $300 and you would have been ahead of the ball game. But because you think you're saving money on the $40, you're missing out on another $260. Mm. So, so sometimes we think that if we do it ourselves, we're saving money and it's not true. You remember, you are the salesman of your company. And if there's no salesman out there selling because you're wasting time on bookkeeping, marketing, brochures and stuff like that, you think you're working, but you're not working because that's spending money. Where instead, you might be better off, I give somebody $100, but me being out in the sales force, I can produce $300. So I prefer to be $200 ahead than to be $100 in the home. Mm. So sometimes we're penny wise, dollar stupid. So it's very important that we kind of measure that uh, through personal interviews. Group interviews is good. You know, uh, 
I remember years ago, uh, one of the men that I was helping was going to run a, uh, was wanted to open a karate school. As simple as that, a karate school. And we started doing group interviews among students in schools. And we went around schools to see if this would be an interest because you could do, it wasn't just karate, it was sport, it was athletics, it was running, it was exercise. And in group settings with parents, we realized that parents wanted their kids to do something in that area of Nutley where we were conducting the survey. So what did we do? We conducted the survey. The people in Nutley told us that they wanted to be there. We went and rented a building in Nutley, opened the school within the opening the doors, we had 100 people in the class. Oh. But we did group interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, focus groups are important. And if you've ever participated in some of those focus groups, a lot of the auto industry does that. Do you like this kind of seat, the way it reclines? Do you like this radio? Do you like that? Focus groups are always good. And product service testing. If you're selling a product, don't be afraid to test it out there and do mock-ups to make sure that you work out the kinks as much as you can before you put a product out. Mm -hmm. Some people are afraid of criticism. If you're going into business for yourself and you're afraid of criticism, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> I, I tell people, be ready to be criticized, be ready to be judged. Some people are not gonna like your service, some well. But what I tell people is I always take everything and I learn from it. And sometimes, man, when you really Put yourself aside, put the pride aside, you really grow and you really learn and you really get better at your uh, trade. So make sure that your primary market surveys, personal interviews, group interviews, focus groups, product and service testing. Market research is secondary, evaluate buying trends and key economic trends. So what is the secondary market? The secondary market is studies that have already been made, especially by the government mm -hmm. and secondary markets really benefit uh, a great deal because it's exploratory research. Mm -hmm. I love research. That's why I went and completed my doctorate degree. Research is amazing because research causes you to expand and causes you to learn. So uh, secondary research can be more cost effective. And what you're doing is you're looking at trends. You're looking at government reports. If you look at the second report that I supplied, the second report is a secondary report. And why is this a good report? Because if you go to census, S-E-N-S-U-S, reporter.org. Let me say it again. Census, reporter.org is a great organization. So for example, let's say I wanted to do business in Dover. And here I have some secondary data. How does this data help me? Well, I want to do business in Dover, New Jersey. Well, Dover has a population of 17,866 people. That's good to know. I want to know what area I'm going, how many people are there. That means that there is 6,677 people per 2.7 square miles. So now I can start targeting zones and areas because if I get 6,000 people out of that, I get 500 clients, that's not a bad deal. So that's where this secondary data becomes uh, valuable. Another part that the census gives me, the medium age is 38.9. So I know that the people that are gonna be attracted to my product are in the neighborhood of 38 years old, 38, 39. So what attracts a 38? 39 year old. So, you know, now I'm getting age demographics. Uh, the population, uh, 18 to 64, 64%. Uh, they have here males are 50% of the population. Females are 50% of the population. When I look, look at ethnicity, I start to see that the biggest number in Dover depending again, my research, my target, who am I going? So let's say I'm going after Latinos. That's why I want to go to Dover. Well, 67% is Hispanic. And that I get from secondary data. So I got this data. You could Google it. You could go to Google Scholar. You could go to Google itself. And you could get this free information. 
So I know that 60% of the population is Hispanic. Uh, I know that 19% of the population is white. I know that 9% of the population is black. And I know that 2% of the population is Asian. So if your business is geared towards a certain ethnic group, right. secondary data is amazing data. Amazing. It's good data. The research has been done for you. You take this data and you review it. Now, depending the product you're going to create, let's say you're going to create a very expensive uh, product. Uh, Louis Vuitton, let's say. Dover is not the best market for that. Well, why? I'm not being prejudiced. I'm not being racist. Why? Because according to the census, which I got in my hands, the average income, family income in Dover is $28,407. I don't think somebody that makes $28,000 is going to buy a $2,500 purse. That's just based on, on data. So secondary data really helps you to see the product, the pricing, and what is the income level of the people you're going to target. Right. So that's where secondary data becomes so, so, so uh, essential. Let me give you some more pointers that I would look if I was starting a business. Uh, individual income was 28. Family income is 64,039. That's the medium uh, income. But if you figure a family is considered a family of four. So for a family of four to be making $64,000 in today's market, there's not a lot of spare income left. So if I was going to open a store, I would probably open a wholesale business. I would open a business that I can give people a good price because that's what that market is going to support. That market is not going to support, you know, uh, $250 sneakers, but it might support 50 60 dollar sneakers so again if i'm going to go in retail what type of retail it has to support the people that i'm serving uh 10.3 percent live below the poverty line you know so it might be a great place to open a charity to open an outreach to open a support type uh non-profit might help in that you know uh children under the age of 18 at the poverty level are 12%. Senior, 65 and over, poverty level, 19%. Uh, transportation, 27.2 minutes is the travel time to go to work from Dover. So it starts to give you a lot of information that's going to help you, uh, you know, three-person households, uh, population type. 50% uh, of those that live in Dover are married. So if your business is geared towards helping married couples, uh, this information becomes uh, valuable. 2.8% uh, of the women gave birth during the past year. So if I was gonna open a business, I'd start targeting those little babies because 2.8%, so maybe I want a baby clothing store or something that's gonna target the children because 28 of the population had babies uh, in that year. Uh, they have 6,207 number of housing units. So do those housing units need snow removal? Do they need maintenance? Do they need repairs? You got 6,000 homes in Dover. So as you can see, secondary data becomes super, super valuable. And a lot of people don't even consider secondary data when they're opening their own uh, business. You know, uh, the average house value in Dover is 266,600. So that's good information to know. So a uh, 12.08 moved in since last year, 74.5 high school grads or higher. 16.9% uh, 6, have a bachelor's degree or higher. Mm -hmm. So secondary data is important data. So I sent this to you guys as an example because you could go for any town and you could do censusreporter.org and it's got so much information that all of it might not pertain to your particular business, but there's information you can pull from here that's gonna help you make a better decision and how you wanna run uh, your business. So I think that's uh, vital. 
A successful business needs customers who will buy what you're selling at a price and quantity that satisfies your financial goals. So you got to think about that. What am I selling? Who's going to buy it? Who's my target? So marketing is not just a one, two, three. I tell people, invest in your marketing, revamp yourself, renew yourself, mm -hmm. because it's vital, it's important. A lot of people say, well, marketing is not important. Marketing is important in every aspect of life, mm -hmm. because anything that you do, you need to attract people. And if what you're offering is not attractive, people are not going to connect with you. So you want to make sure that whatever you offer is attractive, people are going to buy it at the quantities and at the price that you need to sell it in order to uh, make a living. Target market, the group of customers most likely to buy the products or services from, from a particular business. So, you know, who are your customers? And sometimes I ask people, I said, be specific. Who are your customers? Everybody. Not everybody can be your customer. So you got to figure, who am I going to serve? I'm going to serve them well. And it's going to produce volume, it's going to produce success, it's going to produce connections, it's going to produce people to want to do business with me, it's going to produce uh, enthusiasm. And what I tell every business is always prepare. Every new business goes through something called a sigmoid curve. What is a sigmoid curve? A sigmoid curve is this, anything new usually rises, and then if you don't develop a new sigmoid curve, a new strategy, new product, new service. Once it peaks, it flattens. Everything that's new starts to elevate and peak. Once it peaks, if you don't start a new S-curve, a new product, new marketing, new excitement, it flattens. And then it starts to come down. And what happens is when something starts to come down, then you start to fail. So what happens is, Sometimes people look at their business. They call me in as a consultant. They go, Dr. Ramirez, come in. How come my business is not succeeding? And at the beginning, we were flying. Things were flying off the shelf. And now two years later, it's like we're flat. What happened? You let your enthusiasm end. Every new product goes up and it's exciting. But then you have to start thinking, what is the next thing I need to do to keep my product? exciting and to keep my services exciting. If you don't do that, you're going to die. For example, we all remember uh, Blockbuster. As a matter of fact, Blockbuster was one of the best places I remember as a kid. My kids talk to me and say that there'll never be another experience like uh, Blockbuster. Why? When we knew that a snow day was coming, it was just something about going to Blockbuster, getting a movie, all your kids picking a movie, you knew you were going to be snowed in and getting the popcorn and getting the Twizzlers and it, there was something about that. Yeah. But what happened to Blockbuster? They got comfortable. Mm -hmm. So they went from tapes to CDs mm -hmm. and that was a little innovation. So when they went from tapes to CDs, you did well, you did a shift that was good. But then when Netflix started coming around, everybody was like, nobody's going to buy subscription forget Netflix. Netflix can't hurt us. Blockbuster, we're too strong. We have stores everywhere and parents and kids just love coming. How many Blockbusters are around today? No. <laughs> they went out of business. They didn't shift. <laughs> so they had the opportunity to shift, but they didn't shift. And that's what happens in every marketing strategy. We get old. You know, at one point, you know, I remember years ago, Every woman used to like the Farrah Fawcett look. And that was nice for a time. The whole hair and the layers and, and everybody looked like Farrah Fawcett. How many women look like Farrah Fawcett today? Some of you are probably like, who is Farrah Fawcett? I don't know a Farrah Fawcett. What happens? <laughs> times evolve, times change. You know, I remember uh, this happened to uh, Emerson and to Sharp. These are brands that uh, are not as strong today as prevalent, but I remember Sharp studying in business school that Sharp was doing very well with the cassette decks. Yeah. Man, and everybody was buying the boom boxes and everybody was rocking to the beat in the park. What happened? The shift came and they started with the Walkman, but they were like, Walkmans are not really going to sell. But then from that, Apple jumped on it and started digital music. Right. So whoever stay in cassettes, how many of us go to the store today and say, I want a cassette deck? <laughs> it just doesn't happen. 
So what happens is the sigmoid curve is a scientific term. You got to think of yourself. Okay, I went up, I bought a new product, a new service. It was exciting. Everybody was jumping on it. Everybody was happy. But then something happened. It goes flat. And unless you create new excitement, new momentum, it will die. Everything eventually dies. So it's so important that you start something new. You stay innovative, creative, exciting, bring something new, something fresh, energize your clients, energize your groups if you want to be successful. Who's your target? And once you got your target, you got to keep targeting them. You know, what's going to keep you happy? What's going to keep you connected to me? What's going to keep you doing business with me? What's going to keep you wanting to do business with me? That becomes vital. Understanding your competition. Today, anybody that's going into business has to do three types of analysis. Remote, indirect, and direct. Because all three will affect your business. What's remote? If I can get it online, why would I buy it from you? We all have gotten into the habit, especially with the COVID and post-COVID, what did we do? We got used to just shopping at home and letting Amazon deliver it. As a matter of fact, we're lazy. We done set up Amazon accounts. So even if we could get it from somebody else for 2 or $3 cheaper, because Amazon already has our credit card and they already have our mailing address, I'm just going to go to Amazon and order it. So Amazon is going to affect your business. So you got to look at the remote. They're not in my area, but man from a distance, they can hurt me. So you got to think about that remote business. You got to think about indirect. You might have a restaurant that's closer to the people. And you say, well, you know what? That restaurant is five miles away. My restaurant is just a mile away from your house. But an indirect effect could be that the restaurant that is further offers Uber Eats and people can order from them and the Uber is going to take it home. So to the customer, it really doesn't matter that you're one mile away and the other guy is six miles away. The other guy does Uber Eats. So I'm going to buy from the other guy whether you're one mile away because for that one mile, I got to drive to you. Yeah. For the six miles, I just call Uber Eats and Uber comes and delivers my product. So though you're giving it to me cheaper, you inconvenience me. I got to go to your shop versus I could pick up the phone and order. So one of the things that we realize is that people are lazy. If people can get it taken to them, if you can get the groceries delivered to your house, if you can get the products delivered to your house and you don't even have to go to the store, how many malls are closing? For example, I live in the township of Rockaway. You go to that mall, it looks like a ghost town. Most businesses have moved out. Why? Everybody's ordering online. Nobody's really going to the stores like we used to. You know, they're starting to come back. So those are indirect things that affect your business. So you got to consider that when you're running your business. Remote, indirect, and direct. You know, if, if you're going to open a restaurant, for example, I got to do an analysis. Well, what food do you sell? I sell Spanish food. Okay. You sell arroz con gandula and chicken. Great. But did you do your analysis? Because down the street, there's three restaurants that sell arroz con gandula and chicken. And they've been there for 20 years. Now you're the newcomer offering what they offer. Your competition is going to be fierce. If you don't do your analysis, though you could get a cheap location. And this is what people don't realize. If you're going to do a brick and mortar type of business, just don't go because you could get a cheap building. I've seen restaurants, I've seen retails go out of business because I asked them, why did you rent this space? Oh, it's the only space I could find. But then didn't you realize that you're opening a dance studio and there's one that's been here for 20 years, one block away? Why would people come to you when that's already founded and established? You didn't do your analysis. You got a cheap building, but it's an empty building. So I tell people all the time, location, location, location. Just because a building looks nice, just because a building looks bigger, just because a building looks fancier does not make that building good. You got to ask yourself location, location, location. Where am I going to locate my business? And even if it's an online business, how am I going to locate it in such a way and who I'm going to hire so that when people Google, I come on top 10. 
So you got to do some of that. And you got to do some of that uh, programming and maneuvering. That's why you need a marketing expert so they can put you on the top. Because you could be on Google, but if they Google your name and your name doesn't even come up, you're never going to do business though you're online. So that's something to think about. You know, how do I move up the, the ranking? So that's important. Your selling proposition. You know, marketing is part of marketing. I said, you know, your elevator pitch. You know, know that. Know that so fast that you can sell yourself who you are. What is your selling proposition? That's the first thing the bank is going to ask you. And your selling proposition is tied to your vision, to your mission. You cannot sell a product you don't believe in. I remember years ago, people used to sell the Kirby vacuums everywhere. Yeah, we got one. <laughs> we, we had one too. You know, so, so, so what happened? You, 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 you bought it if the salesman had confidence. But I remember one guy came to me to sell me a Kirby, but he didn't even believe in the product himself. So I'm not going to buy from you. I'm going to buy from somebody that shows confidence. What is your selling proposition? Why should I buy from you? You know, and you got to learn to brag a little bit. And most of us don't like to brag on ourselves because we're humble people. We're like, you know, I'm not going to brag on myself. Have you ever seen an, an advertising where they're not bragging on themselves? You know, they look at their car, they say it's the best. Now there's all kind of car out there, by, but Kia is competing with Mercedes. But Kia doesn't say, well, we're just humble. We just got a little Kia. No, they show it on a mountain. They show it that the features, they show it. We're, we're just as good as Mercedes-Benz. You got to believe in your product. So when you go out there, you got to sell yourself. And you got to say, you know, I'm the best. You know, you want to deal with somebody secondary, that's fine. But if you want to deal with the best, give me a call. That's got to be confidence. So it's not arrogance, it's confidence. You got to have confidence because people read those vibes when you come into their business. Mm -hmm. You cannot go to sell yourself and be like, well, you know, well, if you want to, how, how much are you charging? Whatever you want. No, that, you not, no, no. You got to tell people, no, I, I charge $50 an hour. I charge $100 an hour. But this is the service you get from me. Mm -hmm. You got to have a selling proposition and practice that in the mirror so you come across as credible. You got to come across as you're convinced because you cannot go, let's say you sell a product and let's say I, I sell, I sell these markers. I cannot go to you and say, well, you know, I, I sell these markers. Um, um, you know, sometimes they write, uh, sometimes they don't, but you know, I really want you to buy it from me because I'm working on commission and nobody's going to buy from you. But if I come in and say, man, this is a sharp pen. This is an amazing pen. I'll tell you, this works on the whiteboard. It erases, it adds. It's one of the best in the market. It does not leave any streaks. It is real smooth. This is one of the best pens in the market. And because I'm able to offer it to my students, instead of selling it for $55.99, which is what Amazon is selling it. I got them for $30 and you can pick it up today. I got a few of these and these are the best in the market for any whiteboard in the world and works with any computer, any whiteboard in the world. Versus how much is it? Well, you know, it, they, they say 55, but I, I can give it to you for 30, you know, $30. Now <laughs> you're giving away your commission. You're giving away your commission. So you got to have confidence and believe in what you're selling. You're not ripping anybody off. You just believe in what you're selling. If you don't believe in it, don't go into business for yourself. You're going to fail. So what is your selling proposition? I want everybody to think about that. I want you to start thinking already, you know, what's going to sell your product? What's going to get somebody to want to buy from you? What's going to get you get somebody to connect with you? Why would I even connect with you? I want you to think about that and then build confidence. You know what? I, I don't sell keyboards, but again, confidence. You know, look at this keyboard. This keyboard is a wireless keyboard. It works with every whiteboard, 
that's ever been created. It adapts to any computer. It adapts to any monitor. These are keyboards that you can take with you. It has a mouse. It can adapt a mouse to it. You can use this wherever you go. You can put it in your book bag. And from anywhere that you go, you can work a whiteboard. I don't even sell keyboards. But you got to be confident and know what you're talking about so that you can sell a keyboard. So that's so important. And most people fail, not because their product is not good. Most people fail because they don't have confidence in their product. So what is your selling proposition? I want you guys to think about that because mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, you know, what is, what sets you apart? Why would I buy from you? You cannot go, for example, you're doing a cleaning business. You can't come and say, well, you know, what's, what sets you apart? Well, you know, uh, you know, we clean. Do you clean like everybody else? Yeah, we clean like everybody else. Uh, what do you offer? Well, you know, we wipe your desk. So does the other company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're going to wipe your desk too. Uh, what else? Well, you know, we throw away your garbage. Okay, so does everybody else. See, with that type of demeanor, you're defeating yourself. Yes. But I would come in and say, yes, I do wipe desks like everybody else, but not quite like everybody else. I'm going to wipe them with this special spray that I use, these uh, microfiber towels that I use. I don't use that cheap stuff that they use that leaves streaks everywhere. I use uh, microfiber stuff that leaves nothing. It leaves it spotless. I leave it shiny. I make sure stains are removed. I make sure your rugs are clean. I make sure that every garbage can is picked up. And not only do I take the bag out of your garbage can, we rinse your garbage cans to make sure that there's no garbage in the bottom. I want to make sure that when you come in, your place smells fresh. When you come in, it is the best place you're coming into. It's clean, it's spotless. You could breathe and you know that somebody was in here cleaning versus somebody that's cleaning, but you never know that they were in your building. Mm -hmm. What is your proposition? What sets you apart? Mm -hmm. Why would I hire you versus hiring somebody else? All right, I hope everybody's getting pumped up. Get your juices <laughs> pumped up, all right? <laughs> So let's take a little break. I'm going to take a little break, get some water. I'll be right back. For those of you that are online, put stuff on the chat. Or if not, make sure you email at uh, eRamirez at MarsCounty.edc. Uh, and I will respond to you. So I'm going to take a 10-minute break, five-minute break, get me some water. He's <laughs> good. You guys are going to do it. You guys are going to do it. I'll make a million dollars here. Well, I think your brown is good. business but I do a lot of this stuff like this stuff mm -hmm. secondary market I do a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. and I analyze it I study it especially for my accounting practice and how do I get people to connect how do I get people to want to do business with me what separates me well I'm Latino I speak Spanish I can help you with your accounting your bookkeeping your mm -hmm. you know I understand the small business owner so again what is your selling proposition you got to sell yourself mm -hmm. This is this is good information because I've yeah, I've always wanted like the way I would do researches I would try to like Google search and I don't know search like yeah, yeah, yeah. square footage to clean carpet clean or in my area stuff like that but this this is very good information that I never ever thought of to do you know like for instance when I and I like I told you before I was I was going for just like. <laughs> Just cleaning like yeah, towel, yeah. like doing like uh, floor care and stuff like that. But then I started having more, building more ideas to where, you know, um, like what was the term you said? You said sigmoid. The sigmoid curve. Sigmoid curve. Sigmoid. So I started, well, I can start off with that. But I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket because there's seasons to everything. So like, for instance, you know, I thought of maybe start off with that. And then even though maybe they might say, oh, you're in the cleaning service. So can you do this? I said, well, yes, I can. I can provide this service and this and go from there. Yeah, so like, like my landscape, for example, I got a landscaper I've been with him for years. So you'll say, why don't you switch it? I said, because he's the best at what he does. He cuts my grass. But then in the winter, he plows my snow. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and then in the, when the spring comes, he does all my fertilizer. He does all my, you know, he lives close to me. He takes care of all my yard work, all my stuff. It's so inexpensive. I don't have to do it. That's right. I'm going to keep that guy for life. <laughs> <laughs> That's his only proposition that I don't have to do it. <laughs> and he does a great job at it. So, But it, it definitely is um, generating a lot more ideas, you know, and like I told you, I, I'm, I have I have an experience in mitigation, even to apply and incorporate that, and you know even the target market. As far as you know, like you said, you know if you wanted to sell the first adobe, you wouldn't go in adobe. You would go maybe somewhere in Bergen County or somewhere in that. If you do this census, Franklin Lakes. Oh, Franklin Lakes. It's a totally Outline. different. It's a totally All different. The are there are uh, demographic, totally different census. It, it, so I know you guys are probably listening to our conversation online, so let's get started. One of the things I tell them is you can start looking at different areas. Uh, and in those areas, you can really start looking, okay, how do I perfect? How do I perfect what I'm doing? How do I grow? How do I target different areas? And again, it all depends on your economic, uh, what you want, what economics you want to draw. Because sometimes we want to, we talk big, but we don't get out uh the small mentality right you know it's like I, I growing up i had people i grew up in the city of Passaic, and people would say man i want to grow i want to do my own business but they never want to leave Passaic. Passaic is good it'll support a certain level patterson will support a, a certain level but if you really want to grow you're going to have to get out on the outskirts and really start going into neighborhoods that are different you have to be willing to explore explore and i tell every business owner you need to be a type of pioneer you got to go out there and try new things. You got to go out there and open new waves. You got to go out there and really see how am I going to succeed? How What new markets are out there? And take a risk. At worst scenario, people can say, no, I don't want to do business with you. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too. You didn't have the business anyway. Right. So to me, people say, well, what if they say no? Well, you're not <laughs> any better off or worse off than you were. You didn't have the business anyway. Right. So sometimes, what if they say no? Well, you don't have the business. <laughs> so it's better to take a chance. You might get a yes than to stay in the in the no. Organization. This is the next part of today's class. Why is this important? It's something called a SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is in every aspect of business. It should even be done in your personal life. What is a SWOT analysis? Your strength, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. These four components are super vital to your success because sometimes we all just look at our strengths. Well, not everything that you do is strong. There's some weaknesses in there and you got to start looking at your weaknesses. For example, I'm good generating money. I'm good at doing business. I'm a good manager, but I am not organized, a good organizer. I can't organize events. That's not my calling. So I'm not even going to try because if you put me to organize an event, something is going to fall through the cracks because it's not my calling. And we fail when we do things that are outside of our expertise. If you're not an expert organizer, then that's not what you do. You let somebody else do that. You let somebody else run with that. So you got to know your strengths. If your strength is mechanics, then you stick to mechanics. If your strength is cleaning, you stick to cleaning. If it's baking, you stick to baking. If it's counseling, you stick to counseling. You stick to what you know. The problem with us, again, penny wise, dollar stupid. A mechanic can fix my brakes for a hundred dollars. Mechanic can fix my brakes, I say for a hundred dollars. But I saw that I could go to Pet Boys and I could buy those brakes for fifty dollars. So now I think I'm saving $50. The mechanic would have done that in one hour. He's an expert. He's got all the tools. He's going to fix it. But because I wanted to do it, that's not my strength. But I wanted to do it because I could buy it for $50. But now I got to go back to the auto part to buy the tool because I don't have the tool. Now I got to go back to the auto part because I forgot the grease. And I got to buy the grease because you need grease. They got plenty of grease in their shop. But I don't have grease in my house because I'm not a mechanic. So now I thought I would have saved $50, but in reality, I ended up spending another $20, $30 because I ended up buying the tool, buying the oil, and then I wasted a whole day. When I could have been making money and I let somebody else do that, so okay, that's going to cost me $100. But 
but my time can produce $300. So, okay, I'm still two ahead. I made three, I pay them a hundred, I'm two. I didn't get my hands dirty. I didn't stress, I didn't buy tools. I didn't do 50 trips to uh, the mechanic because I stick to where I'm strong. That's a weakness, I'm not a mechanic and that's okay. But what happens? You go today to uh, uh, a mechanic and he's a mechanic. But then during tax season, that mechanic has got a little office in the back that says, we also prepare your taxes. Mm. <laughs> I am not going to a mechanic to do my taxes. Right. But again, you try to get into different fields and then you never really succeed in any of them mm. because you're all divided in 50 pieces. I tell people, stick to what you know. And whatever you're weak, hire people. Let people do that for you. Just because you know how to do it does not mean you should. Does that mean you should? You know, and I realized that, let me tell you my personal experience where this really hit home, hit me in the gut. I could build walls, I could build the deck, I could come and fix a whole house. I grew up with construction with my uncles. But what happened to me about three years ago, I decided instead of paying $50 to the kid that could have shoveled my driveway, I wanted to save $50 and I shoveled it. Well, me and shoveling it, I, I broke my back. Mm -hmm. So now I missed three months of work, back surgery. So I saved 50 bucks to spend a couple of thousand in surgeries and everything else. And I could have just paid the 50 bucks and done what I'm good at and let who's good at what they're doing do what they do. So I think we got to be wiser. Sometimes we think we're saving money and that I want to get you out of that mentality. Hire the experts, let the experts do what they do. Remember that nobody generates more money than you for the company that you support. So it's so important that if you're the one that generates the revenue, you stick to what generates money instead of doing those little tasks that you could hire somebody else to do. Sometimes we think we're saving money. <laughs> opportunities. What are your opportunities? You got to think about that. What opportunity? If I open this business this year, what are my opportunities? What's my market? How can I grow? What's going to trigger success? What's an opportunity that's going to take me further than anything else could take me? Where is it? How can I do it? What's that opportunity that I need to grasp and I got to take advantage of? Then you also got to look at your threats. Who can knock me out of the water? If you ever watch Shark Tank, it's a good show because sometimes they'll tell people your idea is a good idea, but it's easily, it's easy to copy. If somebody copies it, we don't want to invest because this is going to be a seasonal business. You're going to make money, but then somebody's going to knock you out of the water. So you got to think about that too. What are your threats? You know, if you start this business, who are you competing with? What can be the, what are your weaknesses and that can become your threats? What are they? So you always do a SWOT analysis and be brutally honest. Remember, the only person you're fooling is yourself. You know, sometimes we're trying to impress people too much. I tell people, I'm trying to impress. The older I get, I don't want to impress anybody. I'm just surviving, doing what I got to do, and I'm not competing with anybody but myself. That's why a SWOT analysis is super, super important. The next thing you got to do is address the skill gaps in your business. Identify the key processes of your business. What are the key things that your business needs to do in order for your business to survive? What are those key processes that we have to identify are very important. One of the things that I don't like is when small businesses come to me at the end of the year and they come with a box full of receipts and say, here. I will tell you those receipts for you, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you because I'm not sitting there because you didn't do your homework to do your homework for you. Instead of getting organized, hire a secretary, hire an administrator, hire somebody, you pay them $15 an hour, let them do that for you. But now you're going to go to an accountant that's going to charge you $150 an hour to count your receipts. When you could have just given it to a, a secretary to do that for you and you could have paid 
$150, they would have been nice and organized for your accountant. Now your accountant, instead of spending three hours on your return, they're only going to spend 30 minutes on your return. So again, be wise. What are the gaps? What skills do you need to accomplish them? Identify the ones you don't possess. How will you bridge the gaps? So again, what employees do I need? Who do I need to hire? Who do I bring on board? Who, who knows how to do this better than me? You know, if I gotta pay them, can I make, how much money can I make out there? Can I afford this? So these are things that you gotta ask yourself in order to stay out of trouble. Identify your management team. That's essential to any business. Who's gonna be your management team? Who's gonna run with you? Who's gonna take care of the accounting? Who's gonna take care of legal? Who's gonna take care of the employees? Who's gonna take care of the 941s? Who's gonna take care of the 927? Who's gonna take care of the wr 30 Who's gonna take care of marketing? Who's gonna take care of the emails? Who's gonna take care of the phone calls? Who's gonna take care of following up? Because in a business, there's always gaps. There's always gaps. And you're trying to do a lot and you're running and you and there's always somebody's not gonna be happy. One of your clients is not gonna be happy. They don't know all you do. All they're thinking is about their one little job. They don't care that you had a flat. They don't care that a family member passed away. They don't care that you're struggling. They just care about their job. So sometimes business owners want like some sympathy from their clients. Like, can you see everything that's going on in my life? To be honest, they don't. All they see is their one job. I hire you for one job. It's not getting done. You know, I, I understand. I sympathize with your personal life, but I just want the one job done. And that's where you got to grow, get some thick skin, and not be in your feelings because business is not an emotional thing. Business is business and people don't care about your excuses. They just want the job done. So it's vital that as you're running a business, you're like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing. This is how I'm committing. Okay. I know what I got to do. I know, you know, I got to supply. I can't do it. Okay. Who's going to, who's going to cover me? You just can't call a client and tell them, well, you know what? Everybody's off on vacation. You're going to have to wait a week. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. You know, it's like I say, uh, even in the things I do, the show's got to go on. You know, like when people tell me, I'm taking vacation, I'm going to be off and I'm going to be here and I'm going to be there. I'm like, that's fine and great, but the show has got to go on. It doesn't matter. It's still got to go on. You still got to get in there. And even if you got to do it yourself, because the people that are your clients are not going to listen to you. We're too busy or too... Keep that to yourself. They can't really could care less. Mm -hmm. Business is business. So you got to identify your management team. If you're out, who covers? Mm -hmm. If you go on vacation, who covers? Right. Uh, if you're going on vacation, will all your orders be fulfilled? But if you got sick tomorrow, who will run the part of the business to keep the business going? Mm -hmm. So again, these are things you have to analyze. Who's your management team? Vital. Assessing your financial feasibility. So after you think about your management team, you think about your SWOT analysis, you think about your strength, your weakness, your opportunities, and your threats. Now you got to start assessing your financial feasibility. Now you know, okay, this is what it's going to cost me. This is what a management team is going to cost me. This is what I need in order to be successful. This is the way I got to move. This is the direction I got to move in. So now what will it cost to start my business? Now is where you really start putting numbers on paper. Realistically, the attorney is going to charge me $500, $1,000. The accountant is going to charge me $1,000. That's $2,000. I'm going to rent a place. The place is going to cost me $5,000, but they're going to ask for a month security. That's $10,000. I got to do some marketing. Marketing is going to cost me about $1,000. Oh, I got to get the liability insurance and I got to get the workman's compensation. That's going to cost me about $1,500. Uh, okay, I got to, whatever I got to get, I got to hire the a business administrator that's going to run the business for me, management, even if it's part-time, I'm going to pay them $15 an hour times $20 hours a week. That's going to be X amount of dollars. So you got to take all the numbers and put them together and say, this is my startup cost. To start this business, it's going to cost me $30,000, $20,000, $10,000, whatever it is. If it's a cleaning business, okay, I got to stock up on cleaning supplies because I just can't buy one bottle at a time. I got to have bottles because once I start making an agreement that I'm going to clean the office every week, I got to have the money to clean that office every week. Right. So I got to have money. I got to have flexibility. I have to have supplies. I, I just can't tell my client, 
You know what? I went to Home Depot and they were out of my liquid. It's not going to work. So again, what would it cost mm -hmm. to have a little inventory, to have some supply, to kind of be ready if something new landed? What capital equity can I access? Assess. So basically, can I access equity in my house? Can I access my savings account? Where am I going to get money from to cover the startup cost? Mm -hmm. What I tell people, anybody that tells me, all I have is my credit card, wrong answer. Wrong answer. If you've not been able to save, and the only way you can run your business is by getting into debt, that's not good. I tell people, while you have a job, save. Learn how to get disciplined first, because that's going to be part of your success. And the problem with a lot of people is, like I said, you made $50,000 a year. Now you're going into your own business. You just turn around and say, I quit. Okay, and you quit. And now you're expecting the business to make that $50,000. But you need a manager that's going to take 10 because you lack the skills. You need your other team that's going to take three or 4,000. You need the one that's going to take supplies. So now I need a business right off the get-go. It's got to generate $100,000. Well, that business might not generate $100,000 when you first start it off. So again, and a poor analysis will get you in trouble. So I tell people, start saving. If I do all the costs and I see that I need 100,000, we start saving 100,000. We start putting money aside. I even talk to people uh, that want to start a nonprofit. I tell young guys, that say, I want to go into the ministry. I want to do a nonprofit. I said, well, I'll tell you from the get-go, if you don't have $100,000 saved, don't even go in. Mm. They look at me like, 100000 Yeah. That's what it's going to take when it's all said and done just to get started. Mm. So you can't go in broke, because if you go in broke, you're always going to be broke and struggling. Mm. So it's important that you start planning, start saving, work a few extra jobs, whatever you have to do, so that when you do the startup cost, you're able to cover that without getting into debt. Yeah. The worst thing that could happen to a new business is to start a new business getting into debt. Debt will haunt you. Your startup cost. So how will I access capital? Do I have a savings? Do I have collateral for loans? But then collateral is you can take the equity from your house. You know, again, I bought the house for 100,000, I paid 50, I got $50,000 of equity. But if you're not careful, your collateral, you can end up losing your house. So that's why you gotta do the assessment, you gotta do the analysis, you gotta look at your market. What is the potential? You should start your business while you're still working to see if it even works. So what are you gonna have? And then what can you get from your friends, family, lenders, or investors? You know, there's some uh, angel financiers out there that will turn around and give you some seed money. There's some family that might give you seed money. I tell people, hey, I'm starting a new business. Can you help me? Some people might tell you, look, I'll loan you some money. Just pay me back when you get it. Some people might say, I'll loan you 10000 but I want 5% interest when you pay it back. So you got to go through all this. And one of the things that the next part that we're going to start covering next week is how to develop your business plan. Because everything that I'm talking right now will be analyzed by your lenders uh, when you present your business plan. So next week, we start preparing on how to prepare a business plan. And everything that I'm talking goes in that business plan. Because now you need to show that to an investor, a banker, in order for you to become marketable, become successful, become efficient. So you're going to talk to lenders and investors. And what are you willing to sacrifice? You know, when you first go into business, what are you willing to sacrifice? Can we sacrifice a few movies a month? Can we sacrifice eating out? Can we sacrifice not buying new clothing? What can we sacrifice in order to succeed? And be willing to save that money and not feel bitter because of it. Because at the end of the day, if your business succeeds, all the sacrifices are worth it. But whatever we don't sacrifice, we're never going to succeed. So it's going to cost some type of sacrifice. So this is the total assessment. When you're going to open a business, the total assessment consists of personal readiness. That's your personal finances. That's analyzing. That's making sure that we're ready. That make, making sure that your spouse is on board. Making sure that you guys are in 100% agreement. 
and you really want to do this together and you really want to succeed and you really want to move forward with the project. The idea is super important. Where did it come from? What is your idea? Is your idea marketable? Will your idea help you succeed? Will your idea produce the revenue that you wanted to produce in order to support yourself? So the idea becomes super essential. The market. I would never ever go into marketing anything without a primary and secondary market research. Now you know what it is. Before this class today, you had no idea what that was. Now you know what it is. So you got to look at your primary market, your secondary market, in order to see how you're going to succeed and in order to see how you're going to attack it. Your organization. What is your management team? Who do I need? What does my SWOT analysis reveal? Who will I add to my team? Who can I do without? How much money is that going to cost me? How much do I have to invest? So it's a, a total analysis of my management team, of my organization. How can my organization succeed? Who will be on my team? Who will support me? Who will be part of my success? Financial. What, what is it going to take to start up that business? I got to be brutally honest. If I got to buy supplies, I got to register the business. I got to talk to the accountant. I got to do some marketing. I got to get product. I got to get supplies. What is that going to cost me? And you have to be brutally honest with yourself. That financial part, then you look at your collateral. You look at your property. Do I have collateral in my property? If I'm going to borrow money, I better make sure that I can pay it back. And I got to make sure that it's going to be a success. Because now you're putting your house and you're putting other assets in jeopardy. Uh, can I save the money? Can I go to my brothers? Can I go to my sisters? Can I go to my friends? Can I get an angel investor to want to invest in my business and take a risk on me? But then you got to understand that the more you borrow, the more stress, because now it's not just worrying about yourself. You got to pay people back. So it's very important. Your credit score is essential. You know, what is your credit score? How do we bump it up? So I tell people, if you want to go into business, start living today like you're already running a business. Right. Start living on a budget. Start saving. Start throwing money in the back. Make believe it's from the business. Build up your savings account. So when you get up here to the financial part, you have your money. You can say, look, I've got the money. I got the finances. I could pay the startup without the startup becoming a hindrance. Mm. So that becomes super, super important. So next week, but next week, I'm going to send all this stuff to you guys. If you didn't get it, let me know. I'm going to get it to you. But next week, you're going to be looking at prepare a target customer worksheet. I want you to share a little bit. And, and for those of you that are online, you can send that to me if you want me to look at it. What is your target? What is your target client? And then I want you to look at prepare something, look at the area. What's your competition? Who are you competing against? You know, in your case, are you competing against Survey Pro? You know the work, but then now a competition. What makes you better? What is your sales proposition? How do you sell yourself? And again, it takes confidence. It takes assurance. It takes not being intimidated. And, and again, I tell people it's not arrogance. It's confidence. If you're, if you're going to run a business, there's got to be confidence in you. You got to be able to say, look, I know who I am and I know what I'm doing. I want you to prepare a SWOT analysis. And all you do is the four boxes. What is your strength? What are your weaknesses? What are your opportunities? What are your threats? Analyze that. You know, not, don't be ashamed to say, well, I don't know, or I do know, or it will work, or it might not work. Be brutally honest with yourself because the more you prepare in the beginning, the more you prepare for success. And what I'm sharing with you guys is a lot of stuff that I didn't know. I didn't have mentors. I got into the whole credit card debt. I got, I know the whole A to Z. I've been on my own since 1989. Now I work as a consultant with these different companies, but it's through my experience, the good and the bad, the nice and the ugly. So my experience is now your asset. 
at Prepare Startup Cost Analysis. What will it cost to open your business? What do you need for an accountant, for a lawyer? What do you need for supplies? What do you need for equipment? What do you need to start a business? And this is going to help you to prepare. What this does is it helps you to become an entrepreneur. You start analyzing, you start preparing, you start building yourself up so that then you'll be ready when you do your business plan. Because next week, we start the business plan. We'll go over here and we'll start the business plan basics. And I'm going to tell you now how to put all this together and make a successful business uh, plan. Mm -hmm. I know that for the online, I don't know how to use this new software and my boss left. So this is what I'm going to ask you. Go again to eRamirez at MorrisCountyEDC.org. eRamirez at MorrisCountyEDC.org. Pose your questions there and I will answer those questions tomorrow. So again, E. Ramirez at MorrisCountyEDC.org, and I will answer your questions there. Mm -hmm.